Great. So here we see that there's an assignment up from last class called object-oriented first assignment. And most of my messages have been about the other assignment, which is the scavenger hunt. So let's talk about the object-oriented first assignment. You need to have three classes, the game class, the shoe class, and the assignment class. And the whole point of this is just to get you working with these different items in the same file. Um, and then working with input, output, and going from the template to the actual object. So you're given instructions about what the constructors need to look like. The game has to have the name of the game and the number of players. And it has to be in that order. String int. For shoe, you need the shoe size, because double meaning you can have um, decimal increments, like you could have 7.5, and then the brand, like Nike. So it has to be in that order, double string. For assignment, you need the score, which is double, and whether or not the assignment has extra credit, Boolean, and a constructor has to be in that order, double Boolean. And then I give you the prompts. This is what allows the user to enter in the data. And then after reading in the data for the game, create a game object and print out the name of the game. Use the game object you created. And then for the shoe, you create your shoe object and then print out the shoe brand using the shoe object created. And then read in the data for the assignment create the assignment object and print out the score using the assignment object. So this is a sample run showing the name of the game is called Fun Fun. The number of players is three. So it gives you Fun Fun. And then the shoe size, 3.5, and then the shoe brand. And then we see the shoe brand is also called Fun Fun. <laughs> and so then it repeats back to shoe brand, Fun Fun. And then we have enter the score for the assignment, 300, enter true if the assignment has extra credit or false if it does not. And then we say true, and then we say 300, because that was the score. So just out of curiosity, um, anyone here who has finished the assignment? Okay, and let's see, um, how long did it take you? Let's just find out like what sort of difficulty it is. Okay, um, an hour. Okay, that sounds sounds about right. Yeah, I don't think I don't think it was designed to be like a super crazy difficult assignment. It's more just to help people like practice their skills and um, keep things in order. Just more practice working with Memer. Anyways, and submitting files. So if we go back to our other assignment on Memer, we see we have an IDE scavenger hunt. And the scavenger hunt could take you a bit longer. Actually, I was happy that someone finished it during our last class because, you know, during last class, I made a real point to, to use lab time where I said, okay, I do not want to talk the entire time. I, I need to let students just do these assignments, right? So during that, people would message me and stuff like that, which is okay. It's not like not like I said no forbid communication but I did want to have um, 
a time where you could sort of spend some time thinking about it, and then we could come back together as a group toward the end. So since that first person finished, there were other people who finished. Now, there's a lot of skills to learn with the command line, right? This only just brushes the surface, but it does some of the most important things, like cd, which is change directory, okay? So let's do a review from the, from the instructions. What does cd space period period do? Who remembers? Okay, someone says back. Someone says go back a file. So I guess, I mean, go back is good. It's like you, you were in, you're in a directory, you want to go, you want to go up a level. Okay. So this is another issue right here I want to point out. Right, people are not submitting it properly. So it says, when you think you have successfully cracked the chef's secret recipe, right click on the IDE scavenger hunt folder and submit it to this project on Memer. You know, if you submit only the decoded recipe, if you just submit one txt file, that's not going to be correct. You have to submit it properly. So this, this was an issue that I, I uh, helped a student with, which is okay, right? Like I, I, don't, I don't think that's a big deal for me to help a student with something incorrect. But you have to remember, if there are a list of instructions if one thing is wrong, then everything will, will fall apart. It just will not work. So you're, you're learning how to interact with a file system using the terminal. You're running a program in the target language using the terminal. I still do have students who message me about not knowing how to run a Java file. That's one of the main reasons for doing this exercise, to get you more comfortable. Also, I just think it's good for your career, for life. I think it's important to know how to do these things. So I actually went back and redid it, and um, it does take a bit of time, right, to go through things. It's not like I know how to do the commands a bit quicker than, than most students, so it's not really that much time. But yeah, it's, it's a good assignment. I like it a lot. <clears throat> And there you go. So in case you missed last class, those are the two things open. The ID scavenger hunt and the, the object-oriented assignment. <clears throat> and this, this does have unlimited submissions, right? So if the student keeps submitting the same um, recipe file again and again and again, it really won't affect them at all. Let's go back and look at the object-oriented first assignment. And this also has unlimited submissions. So they're kind of low stakes in the sense that um, you need to merge several fi files into one. So yes, that was, part, that was part of the IDE scavenger hunt, right? I, th I seem to remember they do teach you how to do that. They do teach you how to do that. Yeah, 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 that's the instruction. You have to send the things together. So if we go to Replit here, and we just go to create a REPL.
and we'll just make a.txt, b.txt, c.txt. Okay, so a will be high, b will be how, and then c will be are you. I think we should put some spaces in. All right, and then that one will start. So then if we go over here, we can say we're going to combine them. So we'll say a.txt, b.txt, c.txt, and we'll put them all into um, combined. Okay? So then if we click on combined, we see, hi, how are you? Right? So now you can sort of check this out here. And you can see, yeah, no problem. You can see how it works. All right. Okay. So, so underlying uh, replit, just like underlying. Um, Memer is a Linux system. We see here this is Ubuntu. I personally run Windows at home. And let's see here. See, this, this is Windows. This is <laughs> Unix. But you get the idea. OK, so let's go ahead and close this here. And we can close this here. And now we're ready to start looking at files and text processing. Great. What a tremendous way of, of going from one to the other. OK, so this is the length that I'd like you to read through on the syllabus. So it says here, reading, writing, and creating files. Now, let's think back to C++. All right. Try to remember how to read a file with C++. So just see if you can remember how to read and write a file with C++, or just, just read a file. Okay, so somebody, <laughs> that's smart. So um, we see here my file open, then writing this to a file, and then my file close. That, that probably is like at 7.14 in the morning, a pretty hard thing. If you're not doing C++, somebody says, oh, how do you, you know, open and read a file? So perfect, we've got a screenshot of it, good. Now, Java is going to be a bit longer, right? Java will take more. No, 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 I like that. I like that you just looked it up. That's fine. That's actually the best way of doing it. So now we have a lot more to read in with Java, but not ridiculously more, right? So let's take a look at a Java example here. 
Let's see what would be a good one. There's so many ways you can do it with Java. Um, I guess we can look at the. Yeah, we can look at this way. No, that's a writer. Yeah, this is good. This is good. Okay, so here we see a reader. So with Java, we're going to have to make a reader, right? In this case, we have a buffered reader. We will need a buffered reader. And then we will need to loop through, loop through the file. And if there is a problem, we have to put the reader in a try catch statement. All right, that's the try catch statement. And you can catch the IO exception. Catch the IO exception. IO stands for input output. What could go wrong? Well, the file might not be there. The file might not exist. Yeah, so you can, you can have checked exceptions and unchecked exceptions. Checked exceptions can be anticipated. And then unchecked exceptions are unanticipated. So we have lots of examples to work through today about reading and writing files. So this is, this is going to be the focus of today's class. But this is a trail, this Java tutorial. So what I'd like you to do is set aside time to go through it. Now, I, I went through, I want to switch gears now and talk about like making time to do things. I went through and I graded the code review review. Code review review was graded. And I really enjoyed reading what you had to say. I also enjoyed clicking on your coding bat progress. And what I noticed was a lot of students started out doing coding bat fairly often and then there was kind of a long lull there were weeks many weeks of no coding bat practice and probably the funniest thing is that there was no like no penalty associated with people who hadn't in that hadn't done that many coding bat problems. I just wanted to see where people were. But on the day before this was due for the code review, some people did many, many problems. And it would be one problem each minute. So a problem per minute submitted to coding bat. This wasn't many students. It was, yeah, exactly, laugh out loud. It was only some students, but I don't think people realize that coding bat keeps a record of when you turn everything in, right? Like if I go here to coding bat, and it also keeps a record of how long it took you to do something, like how many incorrect things you have, right? Like we see here, um, for some double, I've done this one many times with students, right? This is often, often, often that I've done it. But if you see that somebody does one problem in one minute, then another problem the next minute, another problem the next minute, then that just means they looked up all the answers. Like, you can just go coding that answers. And then there you are on GitHub, <laughs> and you're just looking at, oh, here's this answer, here's this answer. But 
but this really doesn't help you any, right? Just looking at this answer and then copying this answer and pasting the answer, it's, it's just like an exercise of here I am, I'm copying, then I'm pasting here, <laughs> caught in 4K. But, like, it, it just doesn't serve any good purpose because there, there was no penalty for not solving a lot of coding bat problems, right? It was just to see how many problems that you've solved. So, students really need to have a, um, I think, I think grade associated with things. Otherwise, they're just going to say, well, I'm not going to do it. Like here, if I say, oh, read through this tutorial, a lot of people say, oh, no grade, don't need to read through it, right? But if, if there was some way of, of like tracking student eyeballs as they read through it, oh, no, and that's fine, too. That's fine. Like some people, some people had like five, five coding bat finished. And I assumed they just wouldn't log in. So I think going forward, you should definitely stay logged in. Stay logged in going forward. Just for your own like record of progress. But um, it's, it's really like a key thing to, to think now that you're you're learning a skill that can definitely help you get a job, enter this, this challenging industry. It, it sort of needs to get away from, like, you know, in high school you turn in lots of worksheets and then the instructor or the, the teacher, yeah, it is an instructor, teacher, whatever, they grade the worksheets and then they put a grade in a grade book and then you do another worksheet and they put the grade in the grade book and another worksheet. A lot of the things here on the syllabus like I say, oh, read this, complete this tutorial. There's no grade associated with it. So maybe coming out of that tradition in high school of you're just thinking about what's going in the grade book, you're not thinking about the knowledge. Well, maybe that's like something you need to try to get out of that mindset. The mindset needs to be more, this is important for understanding because it's going to be important for my career. It's going to be important going forward in the, the years to come. So it's a long tutorial, right? Is it going to be possible to do every single thing inside here, like, like going through walking the file tree? Well, part of that depends on how much time that, that you really have to, to devote to this. I mean, we're not going to talk about the file visitor interface in the class, which should give you a clue that, that it's not essential knowledge for just doing this class. But to walk through a file tree is, is pretty interesting and cool. And if you have the time, you should go through this. So that's sort of like the way I would talk about, I would talk about this tutorial. Like the most important part is the, the thing that I link to, right, where it's reading and writing and creating files, this, this is really, really important. But there's, there's definitely other parts of the tutorial that have importance as well. Um, if you just look to the left, you can see copying a file. Well, that's getting into what we were talking about with um, the, the Memer assignment, right? So there's definitely a merging of the Memer assignment and what we're talking about today in class. Okay, so we can close these answers to coding bats. We can open up a link to reading CSV files. So let's go here to books.java. Okay, and at books.java, we're going to see an example. Hey, Julia, what's up? But if he's sleeping, I won't hear him. Okay. Okay, bye. Okay, so here we have books.java. So the first thing to notice is we have a number of import statements at the top of books.java. So 
So instead of reading through that tutorial, we'll just look through an example, because you can always read through the tutorial on your own, and then we can make sense of this link and then do an, an example of our own. So we've got a file not found exception. That means that there's no file to read in. I think the, the error messages are pretty self-explanatory here in Java. Like they're wordy, but it's kind of hard to mess up file not found exception, right? Like if, if I asked a random person, what is file not found exception? As long as they're semi with it, they're gonna be able to explain what that means. Okay, then we have the file reader, which we're gonna use to take in the data. Then we have the array list that we've used many times, the scanner we've used many times, and now we have some logging libraries. And this, this is going to be useful for um, just recording when things go wrong. Okay, so now we're gonna make a class book. This is gonna be our template to keep track of the important items of a book. So books have an ISBN, which will be a string. Books have an author, a title, and a publisher an author, a title, and a publisher. And now we make our constructor. So our constructor will send in all of that. The ISBN, the author, the title, and the publisher. And this is what we say is most important about a book. There's, there's other things we could keep track of. What's the average rating of the book? What was the year it came out? But we're stopping it. We're saying this is what we consider we deem the most important for a book. Now we have a two string. Two string is how we display information about the book in a human readable format. So we're going to give the ISBN, the author, the title, the publisher. And then we get to our main method and we're going to have an array list of books. And we're gonna create this array list of books from this CSV file that you should notice in the, in the replit, okay? So we call it book1.csv. And then we make a scanner. So the two are gonna to work together, the file reader and the scanner. So you've already seen scanners before. So scanners and file readers can work together. All right. And we say while the scanner does have the next line, while you can keep reading in books from the CSV file, go ahead and do that. Read the next line, put it into the current line. If the current line contains a comma, if the current line contains a comma, then go ahead and split that line based on the comma. Split means to divide it up. So you come to a comma, everything before the comma is one section. You go to the next comma, everything before that comma is the next section. And the key to knowing what to send in is to look at what's in the CSV. Well, we start with the ISBN, and then we go to the author, and then we go to the title, and then we go to the publisher, okay? So that's gonna be the order in our constructor. We said ISBN, author, title, publisher, all right? Now, we've added this book into our book info. What are the problems that could happen as we're doing this? Well, we're trying this code and we're catching a file not found exception. Then with this file not found exception, if it exists, we can go ahead and log it and say this is a severe problem that we may need to deal with in the future. Now you actually don't need to be quite this technical. You can get away with just printing a statement to the console saying system.out.println file not found, right? So if I just rename this to book two 
that CSV, and I rerun this, we see, oops, I had to do Java C. We see Java C book dot Java, and then Java book, it just says file not found, right? As expected. But if I go back here and I rename this to book one CSV, and I run book, then it gives us the details we wanted, right? Then it gives us the details we wanted. So, let's go down. So then, we have class science fiction extends book. Okay, so for science fiction, we're adding, if it was set in space, and then we're saying science fiction has an ISBN, an author, a title, a publisher, and then whether or not it's in space. To access the parent class, we use the keyword super, and then we can work with this set in space, which is just new data. So set in space equals in space. So this would be a child class of book, and now we'd be able to you know, create readers for either science fiction books or regular books but we have a logical foundation. The class is a logical foundation for working with the data. And it's always so important to be organized. You have to be organized when doing this. Okay, so I see a student typing. Ah, I'm having connection issues, had to log in with my phone. Okay, well, I, I do record these classes now. So if you wanted to go back and refer to these later, you could, which I think is, can I go back to current line and elaborate a bit more? Sure, let's do that. Okay, so current line. Current line is just a placeholder variable, and it's going to read in each line from the file. The scanner is going to take in the file reader, right? We've seen scanner before, but usually when we use scanner, where are we reading in the data? Like in the past, up to this point in the course. Exactly, we use system in. So we use the, the, the keyboard. They're just typing in from the console the, the data. Like if we were doing this book example in September or maybe, maybe late August, we could have done it. It would have just been the people typing in from the keyboard. Type, 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 type. But now we're adding a new skill, right? This is one of the competencies for the Java course. And so we're adding this skill in. And that's file reader book onecsv Okay? Which is a file that we have here on the left hand side here in Replit. Book one CSV. So basically we take the current line and we read it in, store it in this placeholder variable, and then we check to see is there a comma inside that current line which this is a comma separated values file we're expecting there to be commas but something could have snuck in something incorrect so we're checking if there is a comma then we want to split the data based on that comma 
Now this system is not perfect because what if there's a comma in the name of the title? Well, then our system that we have now is going to be totally broken, right? So this, this is not a very robust example to actually make a bookstore online. We're, we're doing this more to show a simple example that doesn't have any commas inside the book titles, right? Now there are libraries more advanced than Split that we could work with for the, the CSV data. Like we, all we would have to do is just type Java CSV library and you see that there's an entire, there's an entire mission, Apache Common CSV, that works with reading in these CSV files. Like they have a user guide, they have progress, uh, project reports and progress reports. And, and this, this is a, like a more serious example that you would use if you're actually trying to make this into a real project. Now, it's not that difficult to use, right? Once you've imported the, the CSV file and handling byte order marks and this and that, working with headers, um, defining a header manually. But this is like a whole study, right? So I'm going to close this and just say for the purposes of this example, we're saying whenever we get to a comma, we're saying everything up to that point is the next item in order as defined by the constructor. So the constructor says ISBN, author, title, publisher. So this is the order according to the constructor. It is ISBN, author, title, and publisher. Okay, one, two, three, four things. And then if we look at our CSV file, we see ISBN, author, title, publisher. Okay, ISBN, author, title, publisher. All right. Um, so I'm going to erase this comment. Erase this comment. Those comments were not needed. And you know what? I think I'll erase this whole logger. I don't think we. I think I don't think we need it. Let me erase this. Erase this. Just try to simplify it a little bit. And let's see. How else can I simplify this? Two string looks good. Um, that looks good. That looks pretty good. This looks pretty good now. Okay, so did that help? Did that make sense, the discussion about current line? All right, sounds good. Because we certainly could, like we have a choice, right? Like we could spend more time with just this example or we could do an example from scratch. Um, I, I don't mind, right? Like, either, either way is fine. I like typing out new examples. It's, it's usually more fun for me. But if you want to, like, keep going over this, that's, that's great. Um, new example. Okay, let's do that. So let's go here and say create REPL. And go here, Java. We can call this one reading in files fall 2021. Okay, so let's think, let's think of an example, let's think of a topic. So something we can get some data on. So anything, anything that you're interested in, like academically. Something we can find data on. Okay, 
interested in programming languages. So let's go to the um, Kyobi Programming Language Index. Here we go. Let's see if they have any Let's see if we can download this. Can we download this as a CSV? Let's see. Tyobi index CSV. Wow, look at what's happened to poor Java. <laughs> in, in 2002, Java was like the most popular. And then slowly through the years, gets less popular, less popular, less popular. I bet if we looked at Python, it would be the exact opposite. Yes, oh my gosh, look at Python. Python went from nothing to, to catching up to Java, wow. So, I mean, this is great, and we can understand this as people, but we need, we need CSV data to do these examples. So, let's see. I mean, I, I can just copy and paste it and put it into, oh yeah, Python has definitely passed past Java now. Um, all right, let's see. I just copy and paste this. How will that look? Let's try to just paste it into Excel. Uh, oh, that's pretty nice, actually. I like that. That's really good. Okay, so this, we don't need this. We can lose this column. Um, this is pretty good. I like this. Okay, so what we can do is we can save this as CSV. So we go here to save as, and I'll just put it in my documents file, and I'll call this one TOB index, and we'll put that as a CSV file. And we say save, and that's very good. So now we can close this. And now we can go back here to reading in files and we're just I'm just going to drag over this document. Okay. Looks good, looks good. I like it. So now we have our we have our link here. Did I send this before reading in files? Yes, I did already send it. So So we need, we need a way of keeping track of this. So do we care about the first number? Um, yeah, I guess, yeah, because that's the ranking. Like we could go in order, but then we don't even need a counter. So it goes order, language, percent, and then increase, decrease. So the order is order, language percent percent decrease increase percent change so just like before we can make a class for this we can say class language and we can have in here private int order private to mean other people can't access this data without a getter or a setter and we can have private string language 
then we can have um, double private percent and percent change. And then we can make a constructor. Oops, I put the private in the wrong spot. So we have to go back over here. And now we make our constructor public language. And we'll say this dot order. Ah, making all kinds of mistakes today. So now we have to send in the data. So we say int order string language double percent double percent change. And then we say this dot order equals order, this dot language equals language, this dot percent equals percent, and this dot percent change equals percent change. Okay, great. Now we can make a two string. And then we can say return something like language has a uh, no it's not necessary but it's it's just like a best practice I suppose like if you don't want other people to change it so we'll say language has a market share of and we'll put the percent. And I think that's all the data we need for each language. So that, that looks decent. Um, so now we have the job of trying to read this in. So we're going to need to have some import statements. So we're going to have to import java.util.scanner. And we're going to need import java.io.filereader and I think we need file not found exception import java.io.file not found exception so these are the three import statements we'll need and then that being uh, Breplet is warning us this is not used okay it's not used so down here, we're going to use it. So we can say here, file reader fr equals new file reader. And we're going to send in the tyobi index.csv. And then we look here and we see, hey, wait, unhandled exception type, file not found exception. Well, that's what I was just saying. The file not found exception, it could be that we don't have this TOB index. So we're going to put this in a try catch rather than just throw it. So we'll say try to look for this file. And if there's a problem, catch a file not found exception. Okay? And we'll call it F. All right. So now with our file reader, we're going to send in this file reader to a scanner. So we'll say scanner s, well, we'll call it scanner, scanner scanner equals new scanner, and we'll send in the file reader. So now while scanner has next line, while this is true, we keep reading it in. We keep reading it in. So remember the order. It's going to go ranking, language, percent, and change. And we really don't need this percent sign when, when we read it in. So we can just use a substring to, to get the last part off. All right. So let's go here and we can say we can say string 
line equals scanner dot next line system dot out dot print line so let's just print out this line and see if this works okay this looks good look at poor Haskell 0.00% and that's down 0.3 so wow nobody likes poor Haskell okay so now we have the files read in we don't really want to print out the lines we just want to start making our index so we can learn more more things about it and let the user interact with it so to let the user interact with it let's make an array list of languages because that's what our class is called here. It's called language. So we can say array list of language, array list equals new array list. And then we need, need an import for this. So we're going to say import java.util.array list. And now we're going to have to add these different items to the array list. So we'll say array list dot add new language. And the order is going to be the first item, but converted to an int. So one way we can convert a string to an int is with integer dot parse int. So we're going to say integer dot parse int. And this is going to be for the first element in that line. Now, we haven't yet split it. So let's split it into something called elements. And we'll do that with dot split. OK, parse int is a way that you go from a string to an int. Do you know what the word parse means? Okay, so if you, if you have like nine in a string, you can't add nine plus eight, right? Because Java will just concatenate the two into a bigger string, right? So you'll end up with 98. But if you turn the 9 into an int, like with parseInt, and then you add the integer with the integer, then you can get 17, right? So now we have to get the first element, which is going to be at element 0. And yeah, no problem. That's a good question. And then we have to get the next item, which is going to be the name, right? The name of the language is going to be at position one. So we say elements position one. And the next two things are going to be the percent market share and the increase decrease. So that's going to be as a double. So we're going to have to say double dot parse double. And we're going to go from elements two, but we only want to go from the zero position to not the last position, right? We want to ignore the last position. So we're going to say dot length minus one. I think I've got something wrong with my commas, but maybe not. Maybe not. So actually, for this one, we can just copy and paste for elements 2 into elements 3. And let's see. Yeah, I definitely have a mistake here. Java's not happy. Replit's not happy. Let's see what the problem is. So, oh, I closed this off too early. All right. So elements parse double. All right, so I've got some problems here. It says new language 
parse int elements, elements one, and then we've got here parse double, Okay, that's for the substring, that's for that. Yeah, I, you know what I had a problem with? I had a problem with parentheses. So, if you don't have matching parentheses, you're gonna have a, a tough time. So, I was missing a single one of these, and it just broke everything, right? Like, if you open a parentheses, you have to close the parentheses. So that was the issue here. I had to I had to fix that parentheses. And now let's run it and let's see if this gives us an error. So we run it and we get an error. Okay. So that's the problem. It says here exception in thread main for input string 0 0.80 percentage sign. And it can't turn that into a double. Hmm. But I thought I wasn't getting the last. Hmm. What's the problem here? Is there a, what, what line is that on? Point zero. That's this one. It's breaking here with 0 0.80. Hmm. Yeah, it's breaking here at 0 0.80. And that's on line 32. So in here. Oh, because look, I used elements three and then I used elements two. Okay, stupid mistake, but no big deal. I think this will fix it. Okay, good. So now we read everything into our array list, right? So this, this does work. This does work. All right. Now, you might need to read through that a little more slowly, a little more carefully with how to use parse double how to get the elements of the array, how to use split, but just Google for, just read about the different elements in more detail, right? Because truth is we're coming up on eight o'clock. If, if we want to finish a working example, we just sort of have to go a little quickly, right? So now we have all the data read in but we really haven't done anything interesting with it, right? Let's let the user interact with it in a certain way. So let's make a little menu. We can say while true. This will be inside the menu. System.out.println, enter or press A to view a language by ranking. Okay, and now let's read in a language that the user wants to learn about. So we'll make a new scanner, uh, scanner s equals new scanner. And this time we're reading it in from the console. So we're saying system.in. And now let's say here, string user choice equals s.next. All right, and why don't we use a switch since we usually use if statements. So we'll say switch based on user choice. Okay, and then we'll say case A is going to be, case A is going to be system.out.println, enter a number to view 1 through 25 and then we can say um, int number equals s.nextint 
and then we can just print out that item. So we can say system.out.println and the array list is called array list. So we can say array list.get number. All right? And then we'll break. So let's see let's see if we if this works. So the default will be system.out.println incorrect option entered. So let's try to run this here and see if this A works. So press A to view a language by ranking. A. Enter a number to view 1 through 25. So we can say here 1. And it says Java has a market share of 17.18. But I thought Python was number 1. Why isn't Python showing up? Everybody type out why you think that is. All right, so somebody says maybe Python is classified as zero. Well, um, by the way, if, if you guys click on the replet, you would have access to click on the, the CSV or the main or whatever. So no, Python is as a number one. Let's see, does the negative have something to do with it? Oh, we're, well, the, the elements length minus one? Okay, so the reason for that was because I didn't want to put in these percentage signs. Is that the negative you're talking about? Yes, excellent, perfect, you got it, great work. So just like arrays, array lists are zero indexed. So instead of just getting that number, we could, we could just loop through, we could say, print i equals zero, i is less than array list dot size, i plus plus. We can say if the array list, and now we can make a getter, right? So we made this private, so I'm going to make a getter here. So we'll say public int 
get order return this dot order. Okay, so I just added a getter to get the order. So now I can say if array list dot get order equals the number, then print out print out the info for this array list. Okay? So now if we're saying we want the number one, we should get the number one. So let's try to rerun it and see. So it says press A to view a language to view a language by rank. Okay, A. Enter a number to view 1 to 25. Okay, we want 1. Python has a market share of 29.66. Okay, now it's working. Press A to view a language by ranking. We want the 25th. It, it says COBOL has a market share of 0.4. And we look here and we see, yes, COBOL does have a market share of 0.4. So the system does seem to be working. Now, what if we try to get like 30? Uh-oh, <laughs> there, there doesn't exist a 30, but at least we don't get any exceptions, we don't get any errors, right? So we sort of limit them to 25. We actually could see a 28, which is Haskell. So we could probably change this to 28, okay? And then rerun it. All right, so now we get 28. Okay, and also we have this nice uh, loop, while true, so you can keep learning more information about these, these programming languages, right? So what we could do something like find the, find the greatest absolute change, which I think eyeballing, it's probably gonna be Python with that drop, but I think, I think that's an interesting thing to look for, right? So we could have case B, we could have case B is going to be, case B could be about, about greatest absolute change. So we could say system.out.println, press B to view to find the largest absolute change in market share, right? So for B, now we're going to have to search through and find the biggest change. So we think we're going to need another. I think we're going to need another uh, for loop. So we can make here something called language, um, language L. And we'll just start at equaling, we'll just start equaling the first item, right? We can say ArrayList.get index zero. And then we can just loop through the rest. We can say for int i equals one. Well, i is less than array list dot size i plus plus, and we'll say if the current item in the array list, if the current item has a greater absolute change than this original one that we have, then set that to be the greatest. Okay, so why don't we go back up here instead of get order? We can say public double get percent change. And then just return this dot percent change. All right. And then we're going to call get percent change. Inside of here, we're going to say if array list dot i dot get percent change and we only want the absolute value so we'll say math dot absolute value of this if this is greater than the one we currently have 
if this is greater than L dot get percent change, then we need to set this current one to be the largest. So maybe instead of L, we can just call it largest. And then we can say largest. We can say largest equals array list dot get I. Okay. And then at the end, after we loop through all this, we should be able to print out the largest. So we can say here system dot out dot print line. Okay. We can say largest is the greatest change in market share. All right, so let's try to run this and see if we do get Python when we say B. So we say B, find the largest absolute change in market share, and we see Ada had the greatest change in market share. Let's see if it really is true. Let's see if that really is true. So we go back here and we see Python had a negative 2.1. Ada, no, Ada didn't have a bigger change. Oh, you know what? I think I didn't check absolute, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't check absolute value over here. I didn't check absolute value over here. I only checked one absolute value, so it didn't work. Now let's try it. I think it should work. B. There we go. Python has a market share of 29.66. No, it still didn't work. Wait, is the greatest... Here. Here. You know what I should do? I should do this. I should make another getter where I just get the, the language. So I'm going to say public string get language, return this dot language. And now we don't have to worry about that to string. We can just say here, um, array, we can say largest dot get language is the greatest change in market share. Let's try this. B, Python is the greatest change in market share. Yes, we finally have a working system. And this is just how we can keep adding features. We keep thinking of new things, case A, case B, case C, and, and we can now really let the user analyze this data in a much more interesting way than just eyeballing it, right? So let's see here. What sort of, what sort of features do you think we could add to this? What features could we add to this? Let's see. We could find out well that would that would sort of require like getting more data I was thinking I was thinking just interesting trends with this um, yeah oh, wow ABAP I've never heard of ABAP that's a language have you guys ever heard of ABAP Honestly, never heard of that. Okay, I guess maybe nobody else has heard of ABAP. All right. Um, well, I think I think we will cut this example short a little bit. The most important thing is right here when we read in the file. And now I have a bunch of other great links that we can look at. Okay, so 
here we have one called here we have one called um, reading files GUI. Let's take a look at the reading files GUI. All right. So here we have a student data .csv, and then we have a class student, and then we have a new J frame. And this J frame is going to be in our class mostly built with GUI builders. We will do examples where we build J frames with GUI builders. All right, so that's drag and drop. We will use drag and drop where you say, okay, I want a label, you click on the label, drag it over. Okay, I want a button, you click on the button, drag it over. That will generate code, which we will see here. All right. So that's like this. The label, the text, the text field, the checkbox. You can type this in just on your own, right? You can just type in the swing but the really nice thing is when Java has it, the Java code is generated by the GUI builder, just in the interest of time, right? Because we only have a semester to learn all this stuff. Anyways, what we're switching to is we're switching to reading in the data. So we're scrolling down and we see, here we go. We've got a file reader with a student data CSV. We've got a scanner, and it's very similar to the example we just did, right? We're reading in the, the programming language data, we're reading in the student data, we're reading in any example that we're doing is gonna be pretty similar just to reiterate the point, right? So in this case, we're dividing students up into international and not international, then we're adding them to an array list, either as international or not as international. If we run it inside of NetBean, inside of Replit, ah, ran the wrong one. Java C new J frame dot Java. Java new J frame. There we go. You see how nice it is to have this GUI? Now we can go here and we can see student name is Jose, he's international, add student record. And then we go to the bottom here. How come this is not visible? Why is this not visible? Hold on a second, F11. Yeah, there it is, view students. Jose International, great. Load students from file, view students. And you see, you see you can add in these other students that are in here. But you get the idea, it's pretty cool, like the swing program is a GUI program, right? And a lot of students do swing programs, do GUI programs for their final projects because it, it tends to be nicer to show to other people. Console-based programs can be great, but these GUI projects are really, really excellent as well. Okay, so who has made a GUI before? Maybe with Visual Basic or, or something like that. Has anyone ever made a GUI before with VB or with any other language? Okay, well that's fine. Dragging and dropping is really easy.
It's a shame Replit doesn't have a drag and drop feature. Replit, drag and drop Java. Mm. No, that's not it. Replit, GUI builder, Java. Uh, but this is all people typing in their code. Yeah, well, this is nice because it shows you, this shows you step by step without using, step by step without using a GUI builder, which is kind of neat. And I mean, it really isn't that much just to do a basic button. Like we can, we can copy this here. copy this into a new Java Swing program. So we can go back here, create REPL, Java, and let's see. Let's see if we type Swing. There it is. Java Swing. Create what REPL. And oh, <laughs> that's even nicer. I love it. You don't even have to you don't even have to copy and paste anything. If you just go to the, the Java swing template, they give it they give you all of that like set size, set locations. That's actually really nice. But I mean the, the GUI builder is still easier because it's just dragging and dropping. But you know if you wanted to make a button and add the button, that, that wouldn't really be too too difficult. Let's see if we can do that. Um, J button. Let's see. Import. Ah, we're getting late on time. Java X dot swing dot J button. And then we can say here J button button equals new J button um, click swing constants um, left and we can say frame dot add button I'm probably getting something wrong but let's see stop run yeah, I definitely got something wrong. It says here, int cannot be converted to a type. Hmm. So yeah, something's wrong with this. J button, J button, swing Java. Let's see. Let's see. Oh, J button, you can just send in this, the text. So here, we just say click, new J button. Mm, no, oh, I didn't close my string. That's a problem. Oh, yeah, perfect. Good, good. Okay, so I got my click but it's in the same spot as this same spot as this one well yeah it's e it's definitely easier when you can use the um the gui builder so this is going to be this is going to be a example i'm going to cut short <laughs> but it it's not a big deal i just have to move the button away from the label because right now it's like over the label so yeah we'll we'll cut this short but anyways 
We're going to continue with GUIs as the class goes on, but it's kind of natural to bring up GUIs when you bring up um, file processing because most of the time the users are going to be interacting with the files probably through a GUI. I mean, I love working with the command line, but most users, average user, does like GUIs. Okay, so have some more code here you can download. I have a little presentation about input output. So what is an exception? How you can design your own exception class? The simplest way to read text is with the scanner and the file reader as we've been doing. You make your file reader connected to a file, then you have your scanner and connected to the file reader. Now we use the scanner methods we've been using all semester. Next, next line, next int, next double. Now, we haven't yet written to a file, but that's pretty easy. You just make a print writer object, and then with your print writer, you can say print line, you can print a double, it will be converted to a string, you can print an object if you have a two string just print a string and then once you're done printing you just close it okay what if the files not there then you get a file not found exception so one way you can do it that we haven't seen yet is you can just say public static void main throws file not found exception you don't have to use a try catch you don't have to use try catch you can use a, you can use throws. All right, you can use throws. So this is a sample program that reads in a file and then prints out the line numbers. So it's very similar to what we had before with the file reader, the scanner. It's just one more example you can type into your replit to practice. You can practice typing these examples into Replit and then running them. And I think this is a good way to learn. I think this is a good way to learn. Right, so you may make a little syntax error and then fix it. All right, so there we see, while the in has the next line, keep reading it in, printing out the line number, etc. Okay. So what if you use the same name for the input and output? Well, when the print writer object is created, then the output file is empty. All right. What if you put the name of a non-existent input file? Well, then you get a file not found exception, you get an error message, and it terminates. Now, file dialog boxes are pretty cool. This is where you can let the user point and click. So to do this, we, you just use a jfile chooser equals new jfile chooser. And then as long as they read in a, the proper option, you can get the selected file and then work with it. So what are some other things that can go wrong? Well, you can have an illegal argument exception, right? An illegal argument exception could be that they're trying to withdraw more than exists in their bank account could be that you're trying to um, trying to access a programming language that doesn't exist. Something like that, you could throw an illegal argument exception. And then the method terminates immediately. Okay? So here we have a bank account that can throw this illegal argument exception if they're trying to take out more than the balance. Now, here are all the exception classes in Java. Everything comes from something called throwable. So if you were to look this up, you could say Java throwable. And then you go to the API, and you look at the documentation, and you see, okay, class throwable. The throwable class is the super class of all the errors and exceptions in the Java language. Only objects that are instances of this class or one of its subclasses are thrown by the Java virtual machine or can be thrown by the Java throw statement. 
Similarly, only this class or one of its subclasses can be the argument type in a catch clause. All right? Instances of two subclasses, error and, accept, and exception, are conventionally used to indicate exceptional situations have occurred. So if we look back here, we see error and exception. Error you can't do anything about. That's like you're, you're out of memory, right? You have a hardware issue. You, can't, you don't have any more RAM. How can the program continue? It just stops. But the exception, these are things that you might be able to, you might be able to deal with. Right? Like, you've got an I.O. exception. Check to see if the file is there. File not found exception. Malformed URL exception. Now, runtime exceptions are a little different. These are things that are happening on the fly. Like, arithmetic exception. You're trying to divide by zero. Null pointer exceptions. Haven't we seen null pointer exceptions? When have we seen null pointer exceptions during the class? Yeah, exactly. That's exactly right. Exactly right. You make a string, it's got no value, it's null. You try to get the length of a null value, you get your null pointer exception. So this is a really important hierarchy. It's, it's definitely a definitely important set of slides here, right? We're, we're ending with some really important stuff. So how do we throw an exception? Well, you just type throw exception object. For example, Throw new illegal argument exception. Now, if you've got a bank account, how should you modify the deposit method to ensure that the balance is never negative? Well, throw an exception if the amount being deposited is less than zero. Right? Somebody's depositing in negative money, that means they're taking a withdrawal. That's, that's not a deposit. Suppose you construct a new bank account object with a zero balance and then call withdraw zero or withdraw 10. What is the value of balance afterwards? Well, hopefully it's going to still be zero because the last statement of the withdraw method never executes. All right, so you have two type of exceptions. You've got a checked exception where the compiler checks that you don't ignore them. All right, so it could be there are external circumstances the programmer cannot prevent. Mostly this is with input and output. So for example, IO exception. An unchecked exception is something with runtime exception or error. Now these are the programmer's fault. So what are some runtime exceptions? Well, a number format exception, you try to put we used parse int before. You try to put um, the letter, the, the, the exclamation point as an integer. No, that's a number format exception. Illegal argument exception. You try to send in negative money to a deposit. Null pointer exception. You've got a string, but you don't give it a value. You get a null pointer exception if you try to, to get a substring from it. And then an error is just you're out of memory. There's nothing to do about that. Okay? So sometimes the categories aren't perfect, right? Like scanner.nextint throws an unchecked input mismatch exception. You can't stop a user from entering incorrect input. And you know this this is easy to start using the scanner, but then you also have to start doing error checking to make sure what the user is entering in is correct. Okay, So we deal with the checked exceptions, especially when working with these files and streams. So the file reader constructor can throw a file not found exception. 
So how can you deal with this? Well, you can have throws, or you can have two string, uh, excuse me, try catch. So try catch is like this. You try a block of code, and then you catch one or more exceptions. You can say catch the IO exception, catch the number format exception. So how does this work? Statements in the try block are executed. Then if no exceptions occur, the catch clauses are skipped. But when an exception of the matching type occurs, the exception jumps to the catch clause. Then if the exception of another type occurs, it is thrown until it is caught by another try block. Okay? So this is the general syntax. You try statements. Then you catch multiple exceptions or just one exception. And the idea is you go specific to general. That way you can catch the specific exception and then the more general exception. All right. So does this make sense about you try things, try code, catch errors? Like to just really try to simplify it. You try code, catch errors. Okay, today's 10.13. much the opposite of last class where I felt like I talked nonstop from 7 in the morning until 8.40. So I did record it and you've got the links to all the examples. The best way to learn all these things is just try to just try to make examples for yourself. All right, and then if we go to the textbook, uh, let's go back to Freer School, go to Java MDC, go to the textbook. Okay. All right, so one, one of the nice things about this textbook is it's fairly short. It doesn't contain every single um, thing that we cover in the class. So that's why on the syllabus, like for today, we have files and text processing, right? So this is the textbook for this week. Does that make sense? How, how to think like a computer scientist, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't really cover this topic in, in great detail, right, or if at all. Um, so if we go here to read it online, and then we go to, advanced, let's see, yeah, they don't, they don't cover this, they don't cover this. So that's why when we get to this one topic, we include this link. So try to recreate the examples we did in class try to type out the code from the PowerPoint but the main thing that's for a grade is you have two assignments on memer right so you get graded on the memer assignments so that's the thing you got to work on first work on memer but otherwise, I took attendance, class gets out at 8.40, so 
we are finished, and I will see you next week. Bye-bye.